Welcome to the museum. I'm Peter Barnett from the Department of Medieval Art and the Cloisters. I'd like to point out before I begin that the, both lectures this afternoon will be captioned by Colleen Platt. The lights down, please. Most of you will recognize the slides on the screen as representative of the way the Cloisters has looked since it opened to the public in 1938 as a branch of the Metropolitan Museum of Art devoted to the art of the Western Middle, Middle Ages, West, Western European art of the Middle Ages. On the left, you see an exterior view from the south, and on the right is a view into the gallery housing the well-known unicorn tapestries. I thought it might be helpful before the films and before Professor Dale's lecture later on to review a little of the history of the cloisters as an institution and its monuments. On the left, you see one of the key figures in the history of the cloisters. That's George Gray Barnard with the hat and the cane. He was an American sculptor known for public monuments, portraits of Lincoln and other historical figures. Barnard had bicycled through the French countryside as a student by 1905, he was returning to rural areas in France to pick up fragments of medieval buildings. He tracked down statues to barnyards and bargained with farmers. He questioned townspeople in inns and markets for the whereabouts of medieval ruins, mostly being used as grape arbors and even scarecrows. He hired rabbit catchers to search their territories, paying one franc for a statue with pointed shoes and half a franc for later ones with blunt-toed shoes. He sold some of these to the Louvre and other museums for several times the purchase price. On the right, you see a lithograph of 1834 showing the Kuxa Cloister, which is the largest of the ensembles Barnard acquired and one that you'll be seeing quite a bit more of this afternoon. And this is just to give you a suggestion of the state of many of the monuments which Barnard acquired by the time that he came upon them. By the end of 1907, Barnard had acquired substantial sections of four major cloisters. By 1910, he gave up his idea of selling the cloisters en bloc and announced that he'd build his own cloister museum in New York. On the left, you see a view of a flatbed rail car in 1905 that moved elements of the Cuxa and saint Guilhem cloisters from the south of France to Paris. He was motivated in part by a 1913 law passed in France that would have prohibited his exporting much of what he had bought. He opened the museum, which you see on the right, during the First World War in 1914. He charged admission to raise funds to aid the families of French artists. By 1906, Barnard had the notion that the Metropolitan Museum of Art might acquire what he called, quote, a period architectural setting for Gothic statues, paintings, and other church treasures. He wrote to J. Pierpont Morgan, who was then president of the museum, offering a number of works. But it wasn't until nearly 20 years later that Barnard's vision of a collection at the Metropolitan was fulfilled. Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller Jr., that is, had visited Barnard's museum and greatly admired it, but he saw the potential for something more ambitious than what Barnard had built. In 1922, a New York newspaper asked, quote, is this gem of French art to be torn from the environment so patiently and lovingly created for it and sold to a more enterprising city, since Barnard was making the rounds of the major museums at that point. In 1925, Rockefeller negotiated a deal with the Met. He already owned the land, which was the revolutionary Fort Tryon and later the private Billings estate. And you see the cloisters under construction on the right on that land. An agreement was reached under which most of the land went to the city for Fort Tryon Park. Four acres of the land was reserved for the new Cloisters Museum, and it was given to the Metropolitan Museum outright, unlike the situation here in the main building where we are today, where the land and the building belong to the city. As many of you know, Rockefeller also bought miles of land along the west bank of the Hudson and gave it to the New Jersey State Park System in order to preserve the view from the new museum. Charles Collins, who had already built Riverside Church in the Gothic style for Rockefeller, was hired to build the new cloisters. After flirting with the notion of a 
building, uh, after flirting with the notion of building a medieval castle to house the collection, agreement was reached to use 12th century monastic sites as the basic model, but it was never the intention of the founders to duplicate any one building, but rather to construct a modern framework to harmoniously blend elements from different medieval sites. Rockefeller was motivated from the outset by the notion that Barnard's collection, housed in a branch museum, would offer New Yorkers and visitors an opportunity to feel they were stepping back in history. So when the museum opened, the galleries had minimal lighting, basically just natural light and candles, and only large-scale objects were on view. These pictures were taken at the time of the opening in 1938, and I think they give you a sense of the sparseness of the installation of the original galleries. The cloisters exhibited Barnard's collection and a few things from Rockefeller himself, most notably the unicorn tapestries. In its nearly 70-year history, change has come to the cloisters, and much of it was the result of Rockefeller's further generosity. In 1925, Rockefeller acquired Barnard's collection for the Met. He'd given the land for the buildings and paid for the construction. In 1952, he gave the museum a significant endowment, which allowed the collection to grow in a significant way. On the left, you see a view of the downstairs gallery known as the Glass Gallery, known for the small stained glass roundels that have always been installed in the windows. And you see it on the left as it was in 1938. And on the right, you see the gallery essentially as it is today, with track lighting and floor-to-ceiling cases that were probably introduced in the 1960s to accommodate the growing collection. The area that's seen the greatest growth has been in small-scale objects of the kind shown in the glass gallery and in the treasury. In 1938, the cloisters had virtually no collection of precious objects in ivory, silver, or enamel, although it's important to remember that the Metropolitan Museum was already rich in this material since 1917 when the bulk of J.P. Morgan's collection came here. On the screen, you see a view of the treasury of the cloisters, which was created in 1988 on the occasion of the cloisters' 50th anniversary, and on the right is a view of the great walrus ivory cross of the 12th century, which was acquired in 1963. You can see in the view of the treasury on the left just how much the collection has grown, particularly since Rockefeller, since the endowment of 1952. I can't resist showing you briefly a few of the things we've acquired quite recently. On the left is the first major example at the cloisters of a Chanlevé enamel from the workshops of Limoges from the late 12th century, and on the right is a silver gold reliquary cross from the same region, which is actually the earliest example of French goldsmith work in the Metropolitan Museum's collection. Both of these were acquired just in the last few years. And so that you don't get the idea that we've only been acquiring objects for the treasury, I show you here two particularly exciting sculptures that have entered the collection recently. On the left is a monumental marble panel from a tomb in Milan carved by the Tuscan sculptor Giovanni di Balduccio in the middle of the 14th century. And on the right is an exquisite small-scale devotional sculpture, the Pietà of about 1390, which was carved in limestone in Bohemia. Now, with just one example, I want to conclude with the work of the current capital campaign, which is allowing us to focus on the needs of the building, which has begun to show its age. Over the past several years, we've turned our attention to the leaking roofs and windows that threaten the building and the collection with the ultimate goal, which we hope to reach in the next few years of bringing a state-of-the-art climate control system to the cloisters. When it was first conceived, the museum was intended to convey the indoor-outdoor sense of a medieval building, and I think in Professor Dale's lecture you'll get a very good sense of, from actual monasteries and medieval buildings of how this worked. Um, and when the cloisters is at its best, the indoor-outdoor feeling allows for the fragrance from the gardens to waft into the galleries with summer breezes, but at the same time it created serious problems for the fragile works of art inside. A new conservation laboratory was opened at the cloisters a couple of years ago, and we're focused on preserving the collection and working now to develop a climate control solution that will maintain as much of the original sense of the building as possible. On the screen now, you see before and after slides of one recent project, the new skylight and renovation of the late 12th century cloister from saint guilhem le dessert It was recognized when the cloisters was built that the fragile stone used at saint guilhem was too fragile to withstand the freezing temperatures of New York, and a glass block skylight was created for it. And you see on the left the white 
glass lens which sits on the stone. This white lens is below the glass block skylight and it sits directly on the stone here, creating, I think the slide gives you a sense of how dark and gloomy that gallery was and it also had begun to leak quite badly. And on the right is the renovated Sankey Lim Cloister which opened this past fall which shows the new skylight which is actually a clear glass skylight with a diffusing lens below that has some completely um, clear sections so that you can see the sky through it. And you can see the architects have devised this little strip of clear story above the stone to give a greater feeling of lift. At the same time, and here I'll show you just a couple of details of the wonderful sculpture at Sankey Lim, you can see the conservators have cleaned the stone, which had never been cleaned before and also had accumulated drips and so forth from the leaks on it, so that the new light and the clean stone really lets the sculpture of this wonderful late Romanesque uh, monastery shine. So in conclusion, I'd like to encourage those of you who haven't been to the cloisters recently to get there sometime soon. The spring is always a good time to go. Um, the garden's coming into bloom, but of course not before you enjoy the rest of this afternoon's program. My name is Meredith Fluke, and I work for the Office of Education at the Cloisters. And I'm very excited to see the Cloisters highlighted and explored in the Sunday of the Met series. And I hope that you are, through today's program, viewing the Cloisters in a way that you might not have viewed it before, or if you haven't viewed it before, that you're encouraged to do so soon. It is with pleasure that I introduce today's speaker, Professor Thomas E. A. Dale, who was until recently a longtime resident of, New York, of the New York medieval community. After receiving his PhD in art history from Johns Hopkins University, Professor Dale earned a professorship in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University, where he taught medieval art from 1990 to 1999. In 2000, he became an associate professor in the Department of Art History at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he currently teaches, and he spent the first year of this appointment as a Coleman Fellow at the Cloisters in the Department of Medieval Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art a fellowship that he was awarded to work on an article which was sub subsequently published in the Art Bulletin in 2001 and was entitled Monsters, Corporeal Deformities, and Phantasms in the Cloister of San Michel de Cusha. Throughout, Professor Dale's scholarship is focused around the portrayal and conception of the body in varying media and medieval contexts. While he has concentrated much of his work on specific case studies in northern Italy, with articles such as Stolen Property, St. Mark's First Venetian Tomb and the Politics of Communal Memory, and his book Relics, Prayers, and Politics in Medieval Venezia, Romanesque Painting in the Crypt of Aquileia Cathedral, published in 1997, Professor, D Professor Dale's research also expands to encompass broader phenomena in Rom Romanesque art, as evidenced in his forthcoming book, Romanesque Corporealities, The Body as Image and Disillumine, hmm, Dissimilitude in the Art of Western Europe, circa 1050 to 1215. Today, Professor Dale will focus on some of his work that grew out of his research on bodies represented in the Cloisters collection, with a talk entitled, The Romanesque Cloister, Monastic Ideals and Monstrous Visions in 12th Century Europe. Please join me in welcoming Professor Thomas Dale. Thank you very much. At the heart of the Cloisters Museum in Upper Manhattan, the visitor is offered a privileged glimpse into the secluded enclosure that was a focal point of religious life in the Middle Ages, the monastic cloister. At left, we see the smaller of two 12th century examples from southern France, partially reconstructed in the museum, that of the Benedictine Abbey of saint guillaume le désert and at right, the larger cloister of Saint-Michel de Cuja in the French Pyrenees. Characteristic of Romanesque cloisters, both feature a rectangular garden courtyard enclosed by rhythmically repeated round-arched arcades decorated with richly carved capitals. In each case, we are presented with only parts of the original monuments that were dismantled shortly after the French Revolution. Nonetheless, the reconstructions in the museum still offer valuable insights into the visual and spatial experience of cloister sculpture. 
as we sit on the stone bench of the cloister garth or walk along its covered galleries, our eyes, like those of the medieval monk, are distracted by or drawn to a wider range of carved decoration focused on the capitals, and the capitals you see here and here. On one hand, the saint Guillem cloister is decorated primarily with elegantly carved acanthus foliage on piers and capitals. In addition, the original cloister included a number of biblical narratives. On the other hand, the Kuja cloister displays a riotous array of naked dancers, double-bodied lions, squatting apes and monstrous mouths mounted upon or devouring human torsos. The functions of the carved decoration of the saint Guillem cloister are quite straightforward. Biblical narratives may be understood as visual reminders of the sacred texts that the monks were reading in the cloister, and the foliate capitals as metaphors for spiritual renewal in the monastic paradise. The monsters and naked men found in the Kuja cloister constitute a more enigmatic genre that has often been dis dismissed as the mere fantasy of the artist. Yet, as I will propose in my lecture this afternoon, by placing Romanesque cloister sculpture in its original functional context at the heart of the monastic life, we are led to understand both kinds of imagery as serving didactic and even transformative roles for the monk. In the first part of my lecture, I will establish the broader context for understanding cloister sculpture, tracing briefly the history of Christian monasticism and outlining the distinctive architecture and functions of Romanesque cloisters. Then I will turn to the portrait images and biblical narratives that served as positive models for the monks in their attempt to regain the lost paradise in the cloister. Finally, in the third part, I will turn to the more problematic images of monsters, hybrids, and deformed men. It will be suggested that these sculptural images were used to externalize the monstrous visions that both mirrored the monk's own spiritual deformities and potentially disrupted his inner spiritual vision. At a time when physical or corporeal vision was understood to affect spiritual vision, and the physical body was thought to reflect the life of the soul, the depiction of both ideal biblical models and monstrous anti-models in sculptural form was also a potentially potent tool in transforming the mind and behavior of the individual monk. Before turning to the interpretation of cloister sculpture, it will be helpful to sketch briefly the rise of monasticism in Western Europe and the circumstances that led to the construction and decoration of Romanesque cloisters. The origins of Christian monasticism can be traced to the deserts of Egypt in the third and fourth centuries. The term monasticism derives from the Greek word monos, meaning one or alone, and refers to the solitary life of prayer, fasting, and sexual abstinence by which the earliest monks sought to purify their fleshly bodies. The more successful hermits, St. Anthony and St. Pacomius, paradoxically attracted such numerous followers that they were obliged to establish a rule or order of conduct to regulate the common life of their newly formed communities. From Egypt, this communal or cenobitic form of monasticism spread in the course of the fourth century and the fifth century to the Middle East and Cappadocia and thence to the Roman provinces of Italy and Gaul. So the monastic homeland starting here in Egypt, spreading through into the Middle East, Syria, Cappadocia, and then eventually to Italy. The most influential monastic rule in the West was introduced around 530 in South Italy by St. Benedict of Nursia, here shown at right in the 11th century Codex Benedictus for Monte Cassino. Initially composed for the monastic communities that St. Benedict had founded at Monte Cassino in South Italy, the Benedictine rule established a pattern for daily life that encompassed both spiritual and practical matters. The monk's day was to be devoted to communal worship in the church at eight times of the day, the monastic hours or offices, also devoted to solitary prayer and meditation in the cloister, 
manual labor in the fields to sustain the community, and regular times for eating the shared meals in the refectory and finally sleeping in the dormitory. Although other forms of monasticism had been introduced into Western Europe from Ireland and the Middle East, the Frankish emperor Charlemagne promoted the Benedictine rule as the dominant model for monasticism from the late 8th century onward. Between the middle 11th and 12th centuries, during the artistic period known as the Romanesque, Western Europe saw a dramatic increase in monastic vocations, paralleled by an unprecedented ecclesiastical building boom and the revival of architectural stone sculpture after a hiatus of nearly 700 years. The impetus for this reinvigoration of monasticism came from the establishment of new monastic orders or congregations of monasteries, such as Cluny and Citeaux, the promotion of pilgrimage, and a broader spiritual reawakening, which led many to seek the quiet refuge of the monastic cloister. One of the purest expressions of the monastic utopia in Romanesque architecture is seen in the Cistercian Abbey of Fontenay, constructed between 1139 and 1147 in a secluded valley of Burgundy. The buildings of the monastic complex are laid out on an ideal grid plan generated by a consistent square module based on the bays of the side aisle of the church. So here we see the church, and if you take one of these squares, this forms the basic unit for the construction of the rest of the plan. As the cloister is central to the monastic life, it is appropriately placed at the heart of the monastery. Square in plan, the cloister comprises an open garden bounded on all sides by covered walkways or galleries, separated from the garden by a stone bench or garth, and surmounted by rhythmically repeated open arcades. The walkways provide direct access to the principal monastic buildings involved in the daily routines of worship, study, prayer, eating, and sleeping. To the north lies the Abbey Church, where the community met for worship during the eight monastic offices each day. On the east side of the cloister rises the chapter house, where the community met each day in the presence of the abbot to deal with the administrative and disciplinary matters and to read one chapter of the Benedictine rule. The dormitory placed directly above it communicates with the south transept of the church so that the monks could attend the early morning offices without going outside. Finally, to the south rise the kitchen and the refectory. The cloister at Fontenay projects an image of order and tranquility, seemingly appropriate to its symbolic role as an image of the monastic paradise. As William Durandus writes in the 13th century, and here I quote, the cloister is a symbol of the heavenly paradise, a paradise where all will live together with one heart in the love and will of God. He further suggests that its columns represent monastic disciplines such as penance and chastity, the cloister garden with its flowers and herbs, the virtues, the fountain of flowing water at its center, the gifts of the spirit, Yet the cloister could also be understood as a much more ambivalent space for the individual monks who were at various stages of their spiritual development. According to the 12th century Cistercian, Peter of Sell, quote, the cloister lies on the border of angelic purity and earthly contamination, end of quote. By this he means that the monastic enclosure is a proving ground for the individual monk as he struggles to achieve the purity of mind and body that characterizes the angels in the celestial paradise. More concretely, Peter goes on to liken the cloister to a stadium, quote, where those who run the race abstain from fornication, adultery, and all uncleanness, and where the monk has begun to tread upon the world and his own body, end of quote. This process of purification the monk achieves by following the discipline of the Benedictine rule, by imitating the appropriate models furnished by Christ and the saints, and by turning his vision inward to the monastic enclosure, away from the distracting sensual images of the outside world. 
The discrepancy between an ideal order or discipline and spiritual struggle is also reflected in how the cloister was originally used and decorated. One of its primary functions was to serve as a place for reading, prayer, and meditation. A monastic customary of Cluny, compiled by Ulrich of Zell, informs us that monks would be seated on the garth within the intercolumniations so that each monk had his own place for quiet reading around the cloister. So here in this detail you can see seated between these double columns is where the monks would be seated for their reading. Yet the cloister was far from a tranquil place. Monastic reading in the 12th century was not silent, but involved a low murmur as the monk orally enunciated each syllable of text to himself. The cloister was also used at certain points in the day to teach the pueri, or boys training to be monks. Set apart from the older monks, they were seated along the inner walls of the walkways with their masters opposite them in intercolumniations of the cloister garth. There they learned their ABCs and practiced learning, uh, practiced reading aloud. Such was the noise of the pueri that at least one monastic customary permits the older monks to leave the cloister to continue quiet reading in the church. Finally, the cloister also regularly served as a point of transition between the life of prayer in the oratory and the more mundane actions of washing, eating, sleeping, and administration organized around its perimeter. The cloister capitals of Fontenay, which we see here, are left blank because the ascetic-minded leaders of the Cistercian order, such as St. Bernard of Clairvaux, feared that sculpted images would distract the monk from his reading and meditations there. Cistercian monks were taught to cut themselves off from sensual images of the outside world in order to focus on purely spiritual images within the mind. By contrast, the more worldly branches of Benedictine monasticism, led by the Abbey of Cluny and its affiliates, filled their cloisters with carved capitals and relief panels, ranging in subject matter from ostensibly ornamental foliate designs to sacred narratives and monstrous hybrids. Amongst the earliest and best known Romanesque cloisters in France is that of the Cluniac Abbey of Moissac. Completed under Abbot Anquitil around 1100, the cloister comprises one of the most extensive cycles of Romanesque sculpture including sculpted capitals and relief panels. Moissac displays some 45 examples of sacred narratives arranged, one or more, uh, arranged on one or more of the four faces of its double capitals. Here we do not find a continuous narrative arranged in chronological order moving from capital to capital, but rather a disjointed series of discrete exemplars, sometimes interrupted by purely ornamental designs or by more enigmatic images of monstrous beasts and demons. Thus, the capital shown now at right, representing double-headed dragons threatening human prey, is juxtaposed with a biblical narrative of the wedding at Cana, shown here in the left-hand capital. Unlike a modern art historian or a tourist, who might seek to look at each contiguous side of a capital in sequence, walking the length of each gallery of the garth, the monk would usually see only the two or three sides of the capitals that were immediately adjacent his head as he sat reading within the colonnades. He might also catch a fleeting glance of capitals as he passed through the cloister or along its walkways to and from services and other activities. Under these circumstances, variety and repetition were considered a virtue, allowing monks seated at different points of the cloister to gain a diverse perspective on the monastic life, both positive models to be imitated and negative models, negative images to be purged from the mind. The Vita Apostolica, or apostolic life, is announced as a model for monks in a cycle of portraits adorning the four corner piers and two intermediate piers of the Moissac cloister. Each panel shows a full-length figure of an apostle dressed in a Roman toga, standing within an archway on a gently sloping pedestal. 
and facing in a three-quarter pose to one side. Each holds a book in one hand, and Peter, here shown uh, in uh, detail, uh, to the right of Paul, also holds his distinctive uh, emblem of the keys. All the figures are carved in a quite shallow, compressed relief, modeled economically with widely spaced concentric drapery folds over relatively flat bodies and nearly cylindrical limbs. Yet they are animated by large piercing eyes and emphatic blessing gestures. One further relief placed opposite the entrance to the chapter house represents Abbot Gerandus, who was sent from Cluny to reform the monastery in 1047. Gerandus is represented in his additional role as the Bishop of Toulouse, vested in an Episcopal chasuble and holding a crozier or pastoral staff in one hand. While the apostles are mainly grouped in piers turned inward toward each other, Abbot Gerandus appears as the only fully frontal figure staring out directly at the viewer. Viewed as a group, the Gerandus uh, panel and the apostles evoke a primary analogy for the monastic life that was promoted by the Gregorian reform of the church beginning in the second half of the 11th century. Seeking to stem the constant interference of secular authority in the investiture of bishops and abbots and to restore a more rigorous discipline for the clergy and monastic orders, Pope Gregory VII and his immediate successors referred to the lives of Christ and his apostles as principal models. Like the apostles, monks were enjoined to give all personal possessions to the poor, to hold all property in common, to share prayer and work together with one heart and one soul. Just as the apostles had been led by Christ, so the monks were guided by the abbot as spiritual father of the community. The same ideal was extended to the regular clergy, Priests were now encouraged to join colleges of canons regular who lived the monastic ideal while serving parish and cathedral churches administering to the laity. The fact that Abbot Gerandus occupies the central position normally given to Christ himself emphasizes the elision between the apostolic past and the monastic present under the impact of the reform. The very style of these reliefs reinforces the notion that the apostles served as role models to be imitated by the monks. The compressed, shallowly carved bodies and rather stereotyped facial features of these figures have often been characterized as representing a primitive phase of Romanesque sculpture, which would only later be fully developed into more illusionistic, descriptive carvings in higher relief. But I would suggest that these relatively abstract figures repeated with minor variations in facial type, might be understood as embodying the ideal of sameness and imitation fostered by 12th century religious writers. As the historian Carolyn Bynum has emphasized, the much celebrated rediscovery of the individual in the 12th century was very much tied to corporate awareness. The individual was defined in terms of distinctive social roles and individual behavior was made ideally to conform to those ideal models. From the late 11th century on, this notion of group conformity was frequently described by using the concrete metaphor of the seal and its imprint in soft wax. Hugh of St. Victor, for example, advises the novices of his order to acquire the likeness of God by imitating the model of the saints. And here I quote, why do you think, brothers, that we are instructed to imitate the life and conduct of good men, unless so that through imitation of them, we may be reformed to the likeness of a new life. In fact, in them, the form form of the likeness of God is clear, and therefore, when we are imprinted by these things through imitation, we are also shaped in the image of the same similitude. We who desire to be reformed through the example of the good as if by a certain seal that is very well sculpted, discover in them certain lofty vestiges of works like projections and certain humble ones like depressions." End of quote. Metaphorically then, these sculpted images reminded the monk that he was to conform to the ideal models of the apostles, to be imprinted with a group identity 
that perfected his individual self. Complementing these portrait models, a series of narrative capitals at Moissac and the Abbey of La Dorade near Toulouse present the theme of the Vita Apostolica in narratives from the life of Christ in the, in the company of his apostles. A direct relationship between the apostolic model and monastic ritual is illustrated here by the episode of Christ washing the feet of his disciples on a capital from Wasak at left and a second example from La Dorade at right. In both cases, Christ appears at the far left, leaning down to wash the feet of Peter, who gestures towards his head to indicate that he wants Christ to wash not only his feet, but also his hands and head. Uh, this is uh, Christ, and here is Peter. It's lost part of the head there. And again, the same two figures here at Moissac. It is the moment during the Last Supper when Christ washes his disciples' feet in an attitude of extreme humility and commands his disciples to do likewise as a symbol of their spiritual rebirth, often described by medieval commentators as the baptism of the apostles. This ritual was imitated by monastic communities once a week before dinner, usually in the cloister itself. Thus, these capitals served not only to remind the monk of the virtue of humility required in the service of one another in the apostolic life, they also provided a visual model for the ritual which symbolically transformed the monks into apostles of Christ. Another way in which the life of Christ might be used to project the apostolic model into the minds and thoughts of the monks is illustrated by the late 11th century peer relief depicting Christ's journey to Emmaus in the cloister of Santo Domingo de Silos in northern Spain. Here, the taller figure of Christ physically projects beyond the frame into the monastic viewer's space and turns around in an elegant pirouette to confront two of his disciples who do not yet recognize him as the risen Christ, but urge him to join them on their journey to Emmaus. On one level, it is an image of Christ's palpable presence and proof of his corporeal resurrection. On another level, the Emmaus scene refers to the physical and spiritual journeys of pilgrimage. Paralleling contemporary liturgical dramas, this relief dresses Christ as pilgrim. He holds a distinctive spiral staff in one of his hands, in his left hand, and he wears a skull cap over his head and further carries a satchel decorated with a scallop shell the emblem of pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. For Benedictine monks, this image would have had a particular resonance in light of the limitations traditionally imposed on their own physical journeys. Although the laity was encouraged to undertake long distance pilgrimages to the Holy Land, to Rome and other sites as a means of penance and spiritual renewal, the monk was supposed to remain within the protective enclosure of his monastery. Thus, Abbot Peter the Venerable of Cluny in the early 12th century affirms that, quote, monks are saved by holy works rather than by holy places. The monastic order prohibits us to see those super celestial places of our redemption, end of quote. Likewise, the Cistercian Abbot Bernard of Clairvaux advises the monk to make his pilgrimage in the mind. And again, I quote, for the object of the monk is to seek out not the earthly, but the heavenly Jerusalem. And this not by proceeding with their feet, but by progressing with their feelings, end of quote. Thus the monk's pilgrimage was understood not as a physical journey, but as a spiritual quest for the celestial paradise within the monastic cloister. Although Bernard was advocating a pilgrimage of the mind in response to the reading of scriptures and the listening to sermons, for the less ascetic Benedictines, pictorial images offered an equally powerful visual stimulus for the monk's spiritual journey to the holy places of Christ's life. The passion narratives in the capitals from the Abbey of La Dorade, now in the Musée des Augustins in Toulouse, provide particularly compelling examples 
As Eileen Forsyth and Linda Seidel have emphasized, the very style of the capitals seems intended to help the monks visualize and experience in more palpable terms the events of the Passion of Christ, as if through the eyes of the apostles. In the capital representing the Last Supper shown here, the sculptor presents the meal taking place within a tangible architectural space under a canopy supported on two colonnettes and surmounted by towered battlements representing the city itself. The table physically projects forward from the columnar supports into the viewer's space, while the traitor Judas reaches from the foreground left across the table to dip his bread in the dish with Christ. John the Evangelist, the youngest and most beloved disciple, leans his head on Christ's breast in a gesture of affection. Symbolically, this tender gesture also alludes to John's exemplary role as spiritual son and lover of Christ. Medieval commentators singled out John as the prototypical sponsa, or mystical bride of Christ, a crucial model of the contemplative life for monks as well as nuns, both of whom were to sublimate physical love into spiritual union with Christ. John was also understood as an exemplary visionary. The liturgy of his feast day describes him as the blessed apostle to whom the celestial mysteries were revealed. It is thus appropriate that he is represented on a second capital from La Dorade as a model for the monk's vision of the empty tomb following the resurrection. Here, both senses of touch and sight are evoked. The disciple eagerly strides forward to see the tomb with his own eyes leaning forward and touching it as he dramatically gesticulates with one hand and steadies himself by holding the central column with the other. This is John here, the tomb here. As the action moves across the three faces of the capital from right to left and around the corner to the tomb, the viewer within the cloister walk would have been drawn into the narrative in a very tangible way, following the movement around the capital with his eyes. Perhaps the monk would also have understood the arcades supported by columns on the capital as the image of his own cloister space from which he participated vicariously in a pilgrimage to the tomb of Christ. It is precisely this eyewitnessing of the life of Christ that monks were being trained to do for in their own exercise, sorry, were being trained for in their own exercises of spiritual seeing. At the same time, the very palpable style of these capitals seems to reflect the 12th century notion of the connection between the physical sense of sight and spiritual seeing. For both the apostles and their monastic imitators, seeing was believing. Contrasting with these ideal monastic models are the monstrous and ostensibly profane images so famously condemned by Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. In his Apologia, written in 1125 to Abbot William of Saint-Thierry, Bernard asks, and here I quote, in the cloisters, before the eyes of the brothers while they read, what is that ridiculous monstrosity doing? An amazing kind of deformed beauty, and yet a beautiful deformity? What are the filthy apes doing there? The fierce lions, the monstrous centaurs, you may see many bodies under one head and conversely many heads on one body. On one side, the tail of a serpent is seen on a quadruped. On the other side, the head of a quadruped is on the body of a fish. In short, everywhere so plentiful and astonishing a variety of contradictory forms is seen that one would rather read in the marble than in the books." End of quote. Bernard aptly characterizes the repertoire of images found in numerous 12th century Benedictine cloisters of southern France and northern Spain, including the example with which I began this lecture, the capitals made in the 1130s for Saint-Michel de Cuja. Now divided between the original site in France at left and a half-scale Cuja on the Hudson incorporated into the Cloisters Museum at right, these capitals display an unusually varied array of monsters and hybrid beasts, paralleling those described in St. Bernard's contemporary text. 
Here we find heraldically repeated double-bodied lions and also bears joined to a single head. Filthy apes seated side by side with naked men, the ape and the man. Monsters from antiquity, such as the siren. And naked dancers interspersed with monstrous mouths, either surmounting or devouring human torsos. In his influential essay on the aesthetic attitude in Romanesque art, Meyer Shapiro saw in Bernard's cloister capitals the expression of an individualistic, secular imagination. And here I quote, the new art is condemned precisely because it is unreligious and an example of a pagan life attitude which will ultimately compete with the Christian, an attitude of spontaneous enjoyment and curiosity about the world expressed through images that stir the sense and the profane imagination, end of quote. Writing in the age of abstract expressionism in the late 1940s, Shapiro believed he had found a medieval model for modern artistic freedom. But he failed to explain why such imagery would have been acceptable to the modern, uh, excuse me, to the monastic community that commissioned and regularly viewed the capitals. Before offering an alternative explanation, it must be recalled that Bernard's rejection of monsters in the cloister was part of a broader polemic aimed at the more worldly Benedictines led by the Abbey of Cluny. Bernard and the more ascetic-minded members of his own Cistercian order sought to return to a monastic lifestyle adhering much more closely and strictly to the Benedictine rule. As we have already seen in the case of the Fontenay cloister, this included the rejection of figural imagery, both because of the expense and because of its potential to distract the monks from their meditation. Thus, Bernard does not condemn the monstrous hybrids, apes and centaurs, because they have no meaning, but rather because he fears that they will distract the monk from his purely spiritual vision. Likewise, when we seek a justification for the appearance of apparently fantastic creatures in the cloisters of more worldly Benedictines, we need to take into account the broader current of monastic thought that deployed both mental and material images as beneficial aids for the monk's spiritual improvement in the cloister. An essential clue to recontextualizing the monstrous images of the cloister is offered by the frequent juxtaposition of monstrous and human bodies in the Kuja capitals. In some instances, naked men displaying the cropped hair and tonsure of monks squat in the poses of apes on adjacent corners of the same capital, thus assimilating monk to beast. Yet on the same capitals, the center of each face is marked by more athletic figures who stand in erect poses and attempt to raise their squatting brethren by the arms. Understood within the context of medieval religious psychology, such juxtapositions suggest a fundamental preoccupation with the boundaries between humanity and the animal or monstrous. Monsters, or monstra in, in Latin, by definition demonstrate or point to a deeper reality the monstrous or deformed body and its verbal or visual representations functioned as an image of the spiritual inner man and his behavior. They externalized interior conflicts and anxieties that went to the very core of the individual's self-identity. Thus, William of Saint-Thierry, the recipient of St. Bernard's diatribe against monstrous cloister capitals, argued that man was distinguished from beasts principally by the faculty of reason, yet he could still be influenced by the lower animal power of sensations associated with the imagination. The ideal soul which follows the lead of reason was understood to be cast in the image of the creator, a man who stands erect, reaching toward heaven and looking up. By contrast, the irrational beings who slavishly serve the lusts arising from the senses are said to, quote, have put off the image of the creator and put on another image, one that looks at the ground like an animal, one that is beastly, end of quote. We see William's notion of putting on a bestial image 
translated quite literally in the capitals that juxtapose naked monks with apes, whose squatting poses they imitate. By contrast, the athletic-looking men standing in erect poses on the central axis of each capital, raising their animal counterparts by the arms, seem to represent a more positive role model for the monk. They evoke in concrete terms Peter of Sell's metaphor of the monk as athlete, struggling to win the race against vice in the stadium of the cloister. The threat to corporeal and spiritual identity is visualized more dramatically by a second group of capitals depicting monstrous hybrids. Amongst this group, we find one traditional hybrid from antiquity, the siren. Repeated on all four corners of a single capital, the Kuja siren displays a beautiful female head with almond-shaped eyes and long locks of braided hair falling over gently sloping soldier, uh, shoulders. And I apologize, this is a little bit dark, taken against the light, but I think you can see the head. The f this is the best preserved side, unfortunately, in the shadows, with the, but you see the eyes here, the long braided hair, and this, this side you can see it from profile. The heads have been uh, lost uh, in this corner here. The grace of the face is greatly enhanced uh, in the preserved head by the rare use of the drill for hair and eyes. Although breasts are articulated, the flesh gives way to a scaly skin, and the lower body divides into a double serpentine tail. The siren owes its prominence in medieval art to St. Jerome's translation of Isaiah 13, 21 to 22 in the Vulgate. And here I quote, but beasts reside there and their places are filled with dragons, and ostriches live there, and satyrs also dance there, and they respond there with ululations in his palaces, sirens in the houses of pleasure. Jerome's own commentary on this passage popularized the idea of the siren as courtesan, the symbol of carnal pleasure and lust. In keeping with what was said earlier regarding monstrosity as an outward symbol of conflicting natures and behaviors, the siren is also described in the moralized natural history of the medieval bestiary as a creature of deception who conceals her monstrous tail beneath the waters and exposes an attractive female upper body. Finally, the siren was also a palpable visual equivalent to the many monstrous guises that reformers such as Peter Damien ascribed to women as the seducers of monks and priests. For Peter, women are, and here I quote, Devil's choice tidbits, the virus of the minds, chambers of unclean spirits, nymphs, sirens, lamiae, followers of the Diana. To, to depict such creatures in the cloister was thus a stirring reminder of the monstrous threats posed to the monk's oath of chastity. A third, more inventive category of monstrous beasts poses a more direct threat to the monk's humanity. The capital at left represents on its corners what at first appear to be a hybrid of man and beast. Below appear the naked legs and buttocks of a human figure, while above we find a monstrous feline head with pointed ears, large almond-shaped eyes, a narrow nose with flared nostrils, and a gaping jaw lined with warts. In this instance, there is a certain ambivalence in presentation which makes it possible that we are dealing either with a true hybrid, a man with a beast head mounted on his torso, or a naked human being shown in the process of being devoured. A second example, still found in situ at the French Kuja at right, unambiguously shows a human body being devoured. In this case, smooth-skinned human arms and hands emerge from the monster's toothy jaw. Voracious, monstrous mouths such as these could evoke a multiplicity of meanings for the monastic audience. On one hand, they alluded to the monks' very real fear of wild animals in the countryside surrounding the monastery, and those threatening beasts mentioned in the Psalms. Psalm 22, for example, refers to the enemies who, quote, gaped on me with their mouths as a, ravening, as a ravening and roaring lion. On the other hand, as Michael Camille has suggested, the devouring mouths could be understood more metaphorically as images of the monk's active ruminatio, 
that is, his rumination on scripture. While he was reading the cloister, the monk was trained to pronounce aloud each syllable and fully digest or chew the sacred text in order to understand its spiritual meaning. Ultimately, however, the most compelling visual resonance of the Kuja creatures is that of the monstrous mouth of hell, represented so frequently in contemporary scenes of the Last Judgment. In the Winchester Psalter, for example, the hell mouth is shown as a great scaly sea monster, reminiscent of Job's Leviathan. Opening wide a lion's tooth-lined jaw, this disembodied mouth devours a host of naked bodies of the damned, including a number of tonsured monks, as well as princes and prelates. Similar images commonly appear within French Romanesque tympana of the Last Judgment. In the west portal of Sainte-Foy in Conque, for example, the disembodied mouth serves, as the, it serves both as the devouring agent and as the portal of hell within which Satan appears again to torment the bodies of the damned at the end of time. Here you can see this is the realm of hell. Christ is up here as the judge, and here the realm of hell has at its opening this hell mouth. And there Satan is. The identification of the monstrous mouths in the Kuja capitals with the hell mouth suggests that we might better understand monsters and other examples of corporeal deformity in the cloister capitals as palpable manifestations of diabolical visions. Already in late antiquity, Macrobius had argued that while man's mind was created in the likeness of God, his soul was susceptible to fleshly imagination, especially during dreams or nightmares. Similarly influential, uh, the early Christian theologian St. Augustine of Hippo described the potential of fantasia, fantasy, the faculty of the imagination. He suggested that it had this capacity to distort what has been communicated to the mind by sight. In book 11 of his treatise on the Trinity, Augustine observes that the mind has the capacity to form images of things that do not exist in reality by enlarging, diminishing, changing, or arranging at its pleasure those things which do exist in another form impressed upon the fabric of memory. Later in the same book, he gives examples of the kinds of phantasms that one might imagine through such manipulations of reality, black swans or four-footed birds. In these cases, Augustine argues, the mind must exercise its will properly in order to avoid being harmed by the potentially shameful fantasies of the imagination. By the 12th century, such fantasies were most often ascribed to diabolical intervention in the imagination particularly during sleep. According to the Cistercian treatise on the spirit and the soul, and here I quote, since demons cannot create natures, they do something which makes certain things seem to be what they are not. Man's imaginative faculty can take on innumerable shapes through thought and through dreams. And although this faculty is not itself a body, it can take on amazing, with amazing speed forms that are similar to bodies. When man's bodily senses are in a state of slumber or of suppression, the imagination can be diverted to the corporeal shapes of other perceptions." End of quote. Demons not only were seen as the force that generated the disturbing, monstrous visions, and I'm just going to go forward here on the left. Demons not only were seen as the force that generated the disturbing monstrous visions and the phantasms of the imagination, they were also described and depicted as monstrous hybrids. The snarling, beast-headed devil with spindly legs, a serpent's tail, and a lion's paw, shown here from the tympanum of the Last Judgment of Autun Cathedral at left, provides a rough visual equivalent to the verbal descriptions of demons by a Cistercian writer, Herbert of Clairvaux. I'm just focus on this figure here while I'm reading. Demons have the habit of appearing in different forms, but there is a form, or more accurately, a deformity 
under which guise one sees them most often. In terms of general contour of their bodies, they resemble monstrous men, gigantic in stature, black like Ethiopians in skin color, agile like serpents, ferocious like lions, marked by large heads and prominent inflated bellies. They have a very frail and long neck, and also arms and legs of disproportionate length. The images of monstrous mouths and wild animals devouring or threatening to devour human bodies finds close parallels in, find close parallels in the dreams and visions repeatedly described by monastic commentators in the 12th century. As Abbot Peter the Venerable complains in his preface to his book on miracles, the souls of his monks at Cluny were constantly besieged by demons who took on tangible corporeal forms, attempting to destroy the spirit within. The threatening lions seen on a number of the Cuja capitals are evoked by Peter's account of a priest at Lusignan. After living a dissolute, ungodly life, the priest, who was nearing death, came to seek solace at a Cluniac priory. There he was disturbed at night by a series of horrific visions in which he found himself flanked by two lions with wide open jaws ready to devour him. A second Kuja capital now in the Cloisters Museum depicts diminutive men by, flanked by paired bears on hind legs. This recalls another demonic dream found in the Book of Miracles. Peter describes how a novice, having fallen into a, light, into a light sleep, felt the ominous presence of a bear pressing upon him. After being awakened by this terror, he was threatened again by a bear who was so close that he could see the inside of its ab abominable mouth and the paws ready to tear him to pieces. In each case, the monk in the text, like the viewer of the capitals, experiences the demonic attack in terms of physical threats to his body. The doubling of the bodies of these threatening creatures in the capitals is not merely an aesthetic device, but rather a monstrous sign of their diabolical source in the imagination. Before concluding, I would like to return to the functional context in which these images were displayed and attempt to explain why such predominantly negative images would have been given concrete form in the very heart of the monastic par paradise. Perhaps the most obvious response is that the capitals provided a visual parallel to the psalms and the prayers that the monks recited to ward off the persistent attacks of demons described by Peter the Venerable. The psalms composed the monk from without. They gave him the internal, the internal harmony to dispel fearful phantasms from his imagination. At the same time, the psalms form the foundation of regular ritual prescribed in the Benedictine rule. Chapter 18 mandates that the entire Psalter should be rehearsed during the course of the week. But the Abbey of Cluny, in the course of the 10th and 11th centuries, dramatically expanded ritual to the extent that 170 psalms were sung each day. In addition, certain psalms were repeated on a daily basis for a particular hour or for a specific liturgical feast. Because they were so crucial to regular monastic ritual, each novice was required to memorize the entire Psalter. Thus, particular forms in the cloister capitals, such as the feline hell mouths, which we have already seen are related to the images found in Psalm 22, would have readily evoked a host of associations for the monk who is already familiar with the scriptural text. Furthermore, the essential mechanism by which the monstrous imagery of the Kuja capitals might be associated with the monastic imagination is suggested by the content of one of the psalms which was chanted at the end of each day during the office of Compline. Psalm 91, qui habitat. The theme of Psalm 91 is that those who put their trust in the Lord need fear no peril. The Lord will deliver the faithful from the snare of the hunter and he will trample upon the threatening beasts, the asp and the basilisk, the lion and the dragon. St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote no less than 17 sermons on this psalm, emphasizing the connection between the beasts and monstrous phantasms of the devil. Because demons have no corporeal existence, Bernard reasons, 
that they uh, strive to possess the human body by entering the corporeal imagination. For Bernard, the asp, basilisk, lion, and dragon of verse 13 are horrible monsters, the works of evil, and the servants of iniquity. They show the different ways in which the devil does harm to the soul through the senses, the asp through its bite, touch, the basilisk through its glance, sight, the lion by its growl, hearing, and the dragon by its poison breath, smell. Given such sentiments, it is appropriate that Psalm 91 was sung during the office of Compline at the end of a monastic day. Compline was designed to prepare the monks for sleep and thus protect him from the demonic forces that might assail his imagination with disturbing phantasms. This is reflected in the choice of prayers, psalms, and hymns. In addition to Psalm 91, the Benedictine rule prescribes the singing of Psalms 4 and 133. Psalm 4 opens with a plea for God's mercy and then advocates self-examination and repentance at this vulnerable time of sleep. It concludes in the hope of a peaceful sleep, and here I quote, in peace I lie down and at once fall asleep, for you alone, Lord, make me secure in hope. After the battles with monsters in Psalm 91, the last of the Psalms, 133, calmly reaffirms God's protection during the night. Perhaps the most explicit reference to the dangers of the night comes in the hymn frequently sung at Compline, Te Lucis Ante Terminum, To You, O Lord, Before the End of the Light. While the first verse seeks again the protection of the Lord before the end of the light, the second verse prays, May the bad dreams and phantasms of the night subside, may the enemy may, be, may he be repulsed, and may our bodies not be polluted. It was as if the demonic forces had to be properly purged before sleep to stave off the disturbing dreams by which the demons might take possession of the animal part of the soul and overcome the monk's chastity with sexual dreams, that is, nocturnal pollutions. It was surely not accidental that monsters were depicted in the cloister, for it was here that the monk spent much of his day reading and meditating upon scriptures, and the very texts he was reading were often decorated with a similar repertory of disturbing creatures in historiated initials. In the early 12th century Cistercian manuscript of Pope Gregory the Great's commentary on Job, the initial P, heading book 18, comprises a writhing mass of intertwined creatures, including a small boy threatened by a dragon and a satyr-like hybrid. According to Gregory's commentary, these corporeal fantasies, as he calls them, were intended to help the monk in his daily struggles against temptations. Commenting on the text of Job 7, 13 to 14, you will frighten me with dreams and terrify me with visions. Gregory writes that dreams are generally to be mistrusted because they so often derive from the suggestions of the devil. The devil attacks holy men who resist his delusive fantasy during the day with particular vehemence while they are sleeping. Gregory goes on to affirm, however, that it is God alone who allows the devil to, attempt the holy, to tempt the holy man. This he permits in order that the holy men may have a foretaste of the last searching judgment when the judge will bring back every sin before our eyes. It must have been felt that the tangible visualization of such diabolical temptations or phantasms in sculpted capitals such as those of Saint-Michel de Cuja, served a similar function both to the recitation of psalms at Compline and to the meditation upon images found in the texts that the monks were reading. Clearly, these images not only distracted the monk as Bernard had feared, but also allowed the monk to purge over time the demonic spirits that troubled his mind and disrupted his meditations there. The powerful purgative role of vision is best explained by St. Bernard himself in his Sermon on Conversion. According to Bernard, images from the sensual world enter into the fabric of memory through the eyes to be left as impressions 
or dirty footprints. The novice begins the process of conversion to the monastic life by beholding God's inner voice as a ray of light. Bernard affirms that reason is enlightened and what is in the memory is unfolded as though set out before each man's eyes. Then the monk is called to enter into a period of physical enclosure within the monastery and especially in the cloister so that the eyes deprived of outward vision might cast their gaze inward. Thus exposed to the omnip omnipresent gaze of God, the convert is stripped bare like Adam and Eve after the fall. It is finally at this point that the convert is able to repent. According to Bernard, quote, the eye which was in darkness before is cleansed by tears and its sight sharpened so that it is able to gaze into the brightness of that most serene light, end of quote. In conclusion, it may be argued that the sculpted images of Romanesque cloisters, such as Saint-Michel de Cuja, affected a similar process of conversion. These monstrous and deformed creatures carved in stone made tangible the malevolent spirits that caused the monk to misbehave and served as a starting point for the cleansing of memory and for spiritual reform. Exposed to the light, the monk's inner demons and phantasms of his dreams would no longer seem quite so frightening or threatening. Only once these monstrous visions were neutralized could the monk continue his daily struggle to imitate more perfectly the lives of the apostles and reconstruct the lost paradise in the monastic cloister. Thank you.